This is the day that he has made. We ought to rejoice and be glad in it. For truly he has navigated our niches and allowed us this privilege of being participatory in this place again. And certainly we thank God for you uh, that are here and those that are watching uh, Bible study virtually. We pray God's blessings upon your life and uh, we do know that he is good. He is good all the time and all the time God is good. Uh, that there is never a time God is not good. Even in the midst of this pandemic, uh, we see the goodness of the Lord. And so be encouraged and be glad and make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Uh, for he is worthy of our praise and worship and adoration. I do thank God for these deacons and trustees that are here and have led us in devotion. Uh, we have heard songs, sang, and uh, scripture read, and uh, we have been prayed for. And uh, certainly that is important. Thank God for the preachers that are here, Reverend Pope and Reverend McCoy. Uh, they have been diligent and committed to uh, Bible study and Sunday services um, since we have been dealing with the pandemic, and uh, I appreciate them greatly. And uh, they are doing it out of their own hearts. Uh, and so we thank God for them. Thank God for uh, our safe travel bringing us thus far. Uh, God, I tell you, is good. And as Deacon said, if we had 10,000 tongues, we couldn't thank him and praise him enough. And as I often say with the tongues of a million angels, uh, we'd still come short of his true praise and his deserved praise and glory. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father in heaven, we thank you again for blessing us to see this day. We thank you for bringing us to a moment of teaching your holy word. We pray, O oh Father, that you take charge, that I decrease, you increase, that the words of my mouth will be the words of your holy word and will be penetrating to the hearts and minds to cut us under the thoughts, intentions, soul, and spirit of the hearer. Again, as always, we pray that you as bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed us until we want no more. Thank you again for this privilege. Lord, glorify yourself as we try to lift your name and glorify you and what you have called us to do. Have your way through us and in us. Change us as we hear you and hear your word taught. Thank you again for these, your people, the New Bethlehem Church, and all that are watching, Lord, via live streaming, Facebook, and other media outlets. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse 12. Tonight we'll only deal with one verse. Um, I thought about dealing with it uh, last week, but uh, I was led to deal with it apart from uh, our Bible study on last week, uh, Perseverance in Prayer. But Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, I want to give you time to uh, locate it or find it in your Bibles. And uh, remember that the arching theme of the Sermon on the Mount is righteous living. And see, we want to uh, see how verse 12 of Matthew 7 uh, somewhat surmises or uh, summarizes uh, the teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. It says, therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Again, therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. 
Amen. Amen. Look with me uh, at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. In verse 17, he says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. What we see is in the Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5 through chapter 7, we see that Jesus is explaining how he came to be an illustration of what was declared of God in the law and what was declared of God by the prophets. That he did not come to destroy but he came to give full meaning, uh, to give us understanding of how the law of God and what was prophesied by the prophets is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So understand that his teaching, the whole of the Bible, the Old and New Testament, is enfold in the teachings of Christ on the Sermon on the Mount. Important for us to understand that, that Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount deals with the old and new covenant. That the old, the law of God, is still good for moral conduct. Amen. That he did not destroy the thou shall not or thou shall. He didn't destroy. Um, That's still in effect and it still deals with righteous living. So all of the Sermon on the Mount deals with righteous living and uh, and it is enfolded in this one verse. Now Matthew chapter 7 verse 12 is known as the golden rule which is the great rule for Christian living. It is Christian because Jesus said it before us as a rule of righteous conduct. Let me say that again. It is Christian because Jesus said it before us as a rule of righteous conduct. Now this is not the first time this particular verse has been stated or said or mentioned because there are several mentionings of it Uh, in other writings, but in the other writings, it is negative instead of positive. And Jesus makes it positive. And because Jesus said it, it makes it Christian. That it is Christian because he said it before us as a rule of righteous conduct. Jesus himself live by this and illustrate it to us how to practice righteousness in our daily living. So those of you who uh, have been hearing me teach weekly may remember the emphasis of the Sermon on the Mount is righteous living. All who are born again, who are saved, and citizens of God's kingdom will live by the righteous rule of God. God has placed within us new hearts 
that seek after his righteousness. Now, let me say that again. God has placed within us new hearts. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, he says that if we are born again, we are new creatures. He has made us a new creation. He has created in us a new intensity, a new desire, and that new desire and that intensity seeks after his righteousness. Jesus even said it in Matthew chapter 5. He says we are to hunger and thirst after righteousness. So if we are born again, if we are saved and citizens of this kingdom, we have a desire, we have an appetite for his righteousness. So God's righteousness goes beyond the types of other righteousness. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 verse 20, except your righteousness exceeds, go beyond, goes beyond, go beyond the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. He says it's absolutely impossible that if you don't have the righteousness of God, there's no way you're going to enter into his place of righteousness, his presence of righteousness. He says, so accept your righteousness, exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. You will in no case, no instance, enter into the kingdom of heaven. So, so our righteousness as believers, as followers of Christ, must exceed, go beyond the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. So what was their righteousness? Their righteousness were corrupt. It was corruption. It, they were lacking in righteousness. Instead of living by the righteousness of God, they lived by their own conjured rules. Their own righteousness. And listen, let me just pause parenthetically and say to us that all Pharisaic behavior is not done away with and dead. That there are people even today who live by their own rule and they call their own rule righteousness. It's self-righteousness. God doesn't honor self-righteousness. That's why we are told not to lean to our understanding. But, but in all our ways, we are to acknowledge him and he shall direct our path. He will give us righteous instructions. So, so we are not to be as the scribes and Pharisees conjuring our own righteousness. We are to live by the righteousness of God. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, seek ye first, make priority his righteousness, the seeking of his righteousness. Make seeking his, prior, his righteousness priority. Put it first place in your life and everything else, arrange it down the line. He says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So Jesus reveals what a citizen of God's kingdom is by expounding on the person, persons and practice of righteousness. In other words, what a person of righteousness looks like and act like. Matthew 7 is a picture of righteousness and principle for righteous practice. Now we're talking about the golden rule. The golden rule. Jesus said in verse 12, Therefore, all things, whatsoever you would that men should do to you, 
do even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, notice Jesus mentioned the word do twice. What men would do, or what you desire them to do, you do. Don't miss it. And he says, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, notice it begins with the word therefore. So, therefore is a conjunction that ties together what Jesus is saying with what he has already said. Now, it is hard to understand verse 12 and see the connection of verse 12 with what Jesus has said in verses 7 through 11. Because in verses 7 through 11, it's, it, Jesus is talking about our connection with God instead of our connection with people. But watch it now because uh, as we connect to God and connect with God in prayer, we submit to the will of God. So when we pray, we invite God to reign over us. Now, underscore that if you have the notes. Now, when we pray, we invite God to reign over us. So, functioning under the reign of God as a community is what verse 12 is all about. So, if God is your God and if God is my God, there's a certain way God wants us to act toward one another. The Bible talks about how we should treat others in the faith, especially those of the household of faith. We are to be kind, affectionate one toward another. We are to love one another. We are to forgive. And it goes on and on as the Bible teaches. So notice verse 12 is about the reign of God over us as a community, as a community. In other words, we should treat others the way God treats us. And in doing so, we experience God's love in the way we treat others. Don't miss that. We experience the love of God in the way we treat each other. That's why the Bible says, how can you say you love God in whom you have never seen and hate your fellow man in whom you see every day? So God, he tells us how to experience his love. We share his love. We become conduits of his love. So when we pray, we yield to God's authority. We submit to God's love. And we share his love with one another. So verse 12, the golden rule, number one, deals with our consideration of neighbors. Of neighbors, of neighbors, of one another, of each other. It deals with our consideration of neighbor. Now, underscore consideration of neighbor. Jesus said, all things whatsoever you would that men do to you. Let me just pause there. Stop there. He says, all things whatsoever you would that men do to you. So here Jesus is teaching us to put ourselves in our neighbor's place and see the treatment of yourself through your neighbor. How would you want your neighbor to treat you? Consider how you would want your neighbor 
to treat you. So the way in which we think our neighbors should treat us is the way we should treat them. So, so notice he wants us to have consideration of, of our neighbors through ourselves, but he projects it through the neighbor toward us. If we had any say-so of how our neighbors would treat us, what would be the saying? What would we say? How would we want them to do it? And he says, the way you explain to them how to treat you is the very way you treat them. God, have mercy. He says, the way in which we think our neighbors should treat us is the way we should treat them. However, Jesus did not say, treat others the way they treat us. He taught against that. He taught against vengeful or revengeful behavior in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 41. Let's look at it. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 41. He taught against revengeful behavior or retaliation. He says, ye have heard it said, an eye for an eye, and a what? Tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee in the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Listen to Jesus. Just the opposite of, of our thinking. Just the opposite of how we've been taught. We have really been taught to be vengeful. But now as blood-bought, born-again Christians, we are taught to give up our right so to speak, for our fellow man's wrong. And, and he wants us to be the better person because he uses us greatly when we are the better person. You can't stoop to people's level. You can't be retaliatory when people say things and, and do things and expect God to use you for his glory and for the extension, exaltation, and illustration of his kingdom. That's not righteous living. He says righteous living is when you choose to submit to God's system of right. This is what God says right. He says if one hits you, don't hit him back. Turn to him the other cheek. He says, if one takes from you, don't spend all of your time trying to get even and take back from him. He says, offer him even more. He says, if one requires a service of you, don't just do a meager deed. He says, go extra and beyond. What's basically required of you? You go the extra mile. Jesus did it in his life. And this is what he's teaching us. He's teaching us to consider our neighbors. We live in a selfish world. And it's easy to become selfish when seemingly everybody around you have a self agenda. You know, it's been said, get all you can, can all you get and set on the can with no consideration of anyone else. But Jesus says that's not righteous living. That's Pharisee. He says, consider your neighbor. Now, notice 
verse 12. All things whatsoever you would that men do to you tells us to act not from selfishness or injustice. It's putting ourselves in our neighbor's place and in doing so we are not partial. We become impartial and candid and just. Let me say that again. When we put ourselves in our neighbor's place, we become impartial, candid, and just. It destroys greed, envy, treachery, unkindness, slander, adultery, and murder. All of the thou shall not, it destroys. When you consider your neighbor, when you put yourself in the place of your neighbor and say, this is the way I want my neighbor to treat me, that becomes the standard by which you treat your neighbor. It destroys greed. You're not covetous because that's not what you want in return. You're not envious. You're not uh, malicious or treacherous. You're not unkind and slanderous. You don't, you know, set forth in behavior of adultery. And you're not murderous. See, one thing I discovered as, as I grow older you know, when I was young, I could dish out a lot, but I couldn't take a lot. And I don't know I'm too old now to take a whole lot of stuff, so I don't put it out there. <laughs> you know, think about it. You know, it's easy to give it. But Jesus said, don't think about it from that point or that perspective. He says, think about what you got to receive. See? You can stand to talk about folk, but you can't stand folk to talk about you. So therefore, if you don't want them to talk about you, don't talk about them. See, he says, you know, you, you may be able to commit adultery, but you can't take adultery. You know, I want to really deal with it, but Y'all hold me now. See, a whole lot of stuff we can dish out, but we can't take. And he says, since you can't take it and you know how it feels, put yourself in the neighbor's place. And, 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 and think on how you would want your neighbor to treat you. There are a whole lot of stuff we do to other people we don't want them to do to us. And what Jesus is saying, that alone should destroy, should destroy what we're doing to others. There's a consideration. There's a consideration. Notice the scope of the consideration. Don't miss it now. Notice the scope of the consideration. He says, all things whatsoever you would. It encompasses all of life, all of life, not just a few things, but all of life. And, and in all of life, we are to consider the desired treatment of others toward us so it would guide us in our treatment of them, all of life. I mean, it narrows it down to the simplest thing, you know, and it broadens it brought it, it broadened it to the broadest of things. Simplest of things, people speaking to you. If they speak to you, you don't speak to them. Reverse it. If you speak to them, they don't speak to you, how would you feel? Small things. Small things that we really don't consider to be something offensive 
something disrespectful, small things. And it goes even unto the broadest of things. You take something from somebody else. You know, how would you feel if somebody else took something from you? Especially if it's a spouse, a car, a job, your livelihood. You know, and all of the things that you really, you know, think on and, and that, that's really holding you together, so to speak. Broadest of things. So he says from the narrowest of things are the simplest of things to the broadest and the most more complex of things. He says, consider your neighbor. It's all encompassing. I speak because I want people to speak to me. I don't take from other people because I don't want other people to take from me. And then on top of that, I know how it feels when you speak and you're not spoken to, and I know how I feel to have something taken from me. And I don't want to inflict that particular feeling upon someone else. Consideration. But now, you just can't leave it at consideration because verse 12 also deals with conduct. The conduct of believers. Jesus said, do. You even so to them. Now, let me read it again. He says, all things whatsoever you would that men do to you, do you even so to them. So, it's beyond thought. The concentration of the mind. It, it's beyond consideration. So, so he adds the word do. Do you, even so to them. The word do indicates actions. So Christian living goes beyond feelings, emotions, and attitude. It requires actions. Action. God has called us to actions. We would rather see than just hear about it. We, we, we need some action. So the actions of the Christian life or Christianity involves doing for others. We see this modeled in the life of Jesus. Jesus did not just come to earth to live his life selfishly. Jesus lived his life sacrificially. In other words, Jesus gave his life to save you and I from sin. He bore the cross for us, died for us, was raised from the dead for us, ascended to the right hand of his father where he intercedes for us and he is coming back to rapture us. It's modeled in his very life. I mean, even in the hard times, Jesus had hard times. And I thank God for divulging and disclosing the hard times that Jesus had in his life. Isaiah said he was a man of sorrow and acquainted with our griefs. But he never lived according to his self-agenda. He always lived by the will of his father. And the will of his father that none perish. I thank God that we were in the hearts of God. In the heart of God, we were on the mind of God that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us, to live an unselfish life, a sacrificial life for us. This is what it really means to do, to do, to sacrifice, to give up self for the sake of others. This is what that do is about. He didn't say do if they do. He said do even if they don't. It requires self-sacrificing. A sacrificial uh, act upon our part. 
We give ourselves, give ourselves, give ourselves, give ourselves. Christian living is a constant giving of yourself, giving of yourself. I, I pity people who really think that they are Christian with no sacrifice. They don't go out of their way to do anything for anybody else. They're so unchristian and so against the Bible. I really pity people who make all of life about themselves. No, God has called us to do for others, do to others. Do so, even so, to them. He commands it. It's not predicated upon how they treat you. But you live by a whole different rule. I told us that he didn't uh, uh, call us to revengeful behavior and retaliatory behavior. He didn't call us to that. He called us to live a righteous life. And this is what righteousness looked like. Righteousness is sacrificial. It's sacrificial. Jesus' life teaches us how to live sacrificially by putting others before self. Cross was before him. Had a conversation with his father in the Garden of Gethsemane. Three times he went to his father for the removal of the cup. He finally concluded, nevertheless, not my will, thine will be done. He submitted to the will of his father. And in so doing, he became the sacrifice we needed to escape the wrath of God. Praise the Lord for his sacrifice. What are you willing to do to get somebody saved? To what extent are you willing to go to help somebody come to know Jesus? It requires action. It's more than just getting together in a meeting setting, talking about things. Something has to happen after he says, even so, you do. Even so, you do. I like that. Conduct. Conduct. A whole lot of people talking about they love the Lord, but there's no doing, no action. Love is an action word. Let me kind of explain it to you if you merit. Your boo, your bae say they love you, but there's never a kind gesture. You're trying to figure out what kind of love is that. Don't ever bring you nothing home. Don't ever, you know, treat you in kindness or in respect. What kind of love is that? Never put themselves out of the way for you. What kind of love is that? Love makes us do. Consideration of others should make us do. Even when we think about the world and the terrible world, the terrible condition the world is in, as we see people lost, people losing their lives to gain violence, injustice, racial tension, you know, and just on and on. Disease. You know, not having health care. And we see it, and it seems to have no effect on us. What kind of love is that? What kind of consideration is that? But if we put ourselves in that place, it makes us do. It puts us on the front line. 
It causes us to charge the hill for the welfare and the well-being of others. That's the conduct. But now, Jesus, he, 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 he closes out verse 12 in dealing with the core, that this is the core teaching of the Old and New Testament. Now, I'm almost finished. He said, notice that for this, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, we know the law and the prophets were the Old Testament. It's Old Testament, Old Testament, law, prophets. That's what's contained in the Old Testament. Now, watch what Jesus said again in verse 5, I mean, verse 17 of chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. Listen to him. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill. Fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. All of the law that God gave to Israel at Sinai had a single purpose. Don't miss this. He gave it to show the nation how wonderful it is to live under his reign, God's reign, rather than human rulers. All the messages that God sent to Israel through the prophets had a single purpose. It was to call them back into submission to their heavenly king so they would know the blessings of living under his reign. All the law and the prophets, which is the entire Old Testament, call people of God to love God and love each other. Don't miss that. To love God, first and foremost... That's the vertical line of relationship. And to love each other, that's the horizontal line. You see it? Now, that's Old Testament. But we also see it in the New Testament. That the core commandment of Jesus' kingship is taught by this verse. Now, John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35 say, A new commandment I give unto you. That you love one another as I have loved you. That ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love one to another. So people know you are his by your love. Not by what you're saying, by what you're doing. So it's the core, it's the core, it's the core. Notice the core of Jesus' teaching. It is, it is stated even better in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. You want to know what the Bible is about? Here it is. Loving God and loving one another. The whole Bible is about loving God. And loving one another. Now, this is the truth. You cannot love God if you have not accepted the love of God. 
Because God loved us when we didn't even love him. That's why the Bible says that he commended his love. He put it on display. He showcased it. That's what Calvary is. Calvary is a showcasing of God's love. That he put it on display while we were sinners. Christ died. He didn't wait until we got right because the truth is we couldn't get right without it. He did it to make us right. To get us right by faith. And he, he says, when we have accepted his love, we then can love him and love one another. We become conduits of his love. And so as we consider our neighbors, we share love. We share love. Watch him. He says, this is what the whole Old Testament and New Testament is about. Loving God and loving our fellow man. Now, turn with me, if you will, to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 19, one verse, verse 18. It says, thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Do you see that? See, Old and New Testament is talking about love, love, loving God, loving each other. We see uh, that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, watch him in Deuteronomy. Watch him in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verse 5. It says, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. You see it? All of the law and prophets. See, even the Old Testament dealt with loving God and loving one another. <laughs> now, this is the last It serves as the core of kingdom living. Verse 12 of Matthew chapter 7. John chapter 15 verses 9 through 17 says, As the Father had loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If ye keep my commandment, ye shall abide in my love even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord doeth or does. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that 
whatsoever ye shall ask in the Father, in, of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you. That you love one another. This whole verse 12 deals with what the Old and New Testament is about. We call it the golden rule. In short, we say do unto others as if you will have them to do unto you. And Jesus says that if you would do that, there has to be careful consideration of your neighbor, your desired neighbor's behavior toward you. And whatever you think they should do toward you is what you should do toward them. Lord, help me. And he says, make that your conduct. Don't just talk Christianity. Don't just talk a good game with no play. You know, it is said that the best players are on the sideline that, that when you come out of the game, they can tell you what you should have done. They have a sideline view, but they don't have an in-game view. They don't see it from an action perspective. They only see it from an observant perspective. A whole lot of people can talk about what you ought to do. No, no, this is a do. He has called us to do. Righteousness is not just positional, it's also practical. He wants us to do even so to them. Do. But then he says, know that this is Bible. This is the core teachings of the Old and New Testament. That what we do we don't just do to do. We do because we love God and we love one another. See, love makes you do far beyond what you said you'll do. And that's what we ought to be doing as Christians. How much is enough? Just a little bit more. We ought to be willing to always go beyond the little markers we set the lines we draw in the sand to help somebody else know Christ receive the love of Christ love Christ and love others he says if we do that we have fulfilled what Jesus has said in the golden rule, all things, whatsoever you would that men do to you, do you even so to them. And he closes by saying that this is, this is the law and the prophets. The whole book is about love. It's God's love story. How we are loved by him, how we should love him, and how we should love one another. God bless you. God, we thank you again for blessing us to see this day and allowing us to share, Lord, a simple but yet profound truth that you have called us to consideration of others, conduct as believers and the core teachings of your Bible, both old and new. We thank you, Father, for challenging us to live righteously and to, Father, honor you with our love, our faith, exemplified in our actions. Forgive us for not living by this.
for we have all sinned and come short of your glory. But thank you for simplifying for us what the six, six books are about. Thank you for making plain for us as we read and study what the Bible is about. You love us and we love you and we love others in Jesus name amen Thank mm-hmm. you.